Hi, everyone. Sorry you've got my back. <laughs> but yes. you can have my back, yeah. That's and sorry want. you have my back. But thank you all for being here promptly and uh, filling this marvelous space. I'm Arianna Huffington, the founder of the Huffington Post and now the founder and CEO of Thrive Global. I'm really delighted to be here with Jamie, um, who doesn't need a big introduction, but he's going to get a little one. As a chef and restaurateur, he has really revolutionized how we think about food. His cooking is celebrated the world over, and he now owns five restaurants with branches all over the world. At the ripe old age of 24, he debuted on the BBC as the Naked Chef, and his subsequent cookbook became a number one bestseller in the UK. Over 20 more books have followed. But something you may not know is that his mom and dad have for 40 years now owned a pub where um, Jamie sort of learned uh, how to be in the community, how to care for the community, and how to be cared by the community. And he continues to have a weekend home in the place where he grew up, which is just part of uh, the reason I feel he's so rooted in people's lives. Um, his activism is also celebrated through his foundation. Jamie's campaigning for a food revolution that would provide healthy, nutritious food to all children, reduce obesity and sugar consumption, and educate children and young people how to cook, how to garden, and how to be stewards of their diets and their health. And he's done all that while raising five children, <laughs> <laughs> the, the yeah. oldest of whom is 15, and the youngest five months old. Please welcome Jamie Oliver. <laughs> Thank you. So Jamie, let's start with a problem. What is the problem, and why do we need to change the way we eat? Well. Look, back in the day, 20 years ago, um, uh, importantly, you know, it was my job then uh, was about disrupting TV cookery. You know, get rid of the chef whites, go home, cook the food you cook at home. You know, represent that boys could cook. Most women were cooking, even though women were going to work as much. And, and there was like a kind of moment where, uh, even though men and women were both working, they'd get home and the men of Britain would look at their wives and go was for dinner. <laughs> so um, it was a time for disruption, and it was about that cooking's for anyone. Cooking's a joy. Cooking doesn't have to be, you know, all weighed, and it's not an exam. You know, you've got to feel it, connect. Um, it can be really simple. And, you know, so in the early days, it was just joyful. My, really, my only job was just to prove that cooking wasn't for girls. Cooking got you girls. And, <laughs> um, and that followed by two years of hatred of men in Britain. And, and then after about two years, they kind of got it. And um, so it was, at that point, it was quite innocent. It was just the joy of cooking and community and farmers. And people loved that. But I think as I got older and as I was exposed to more and more people and data and the world that you live in, um, when you're enlightened by things and you become aware of things, you don't have the benefit of ignorance. You know, when you know stuff, when you know things are a problem, um, it affects you. It, it changes the way you process things. And I realized that the platform that I created, which was, it was a kind of phenomenon, because we, we went from zero territories to, you know, 120 countries around the world, um, you know, eight published in 80 countries. It kind of went crazy. So I started to realize that it wasn't just about the joy of food. Actually, there was a disconnect. The food system was broke, um, and that food took a while for me to learn that the biggest industry on the planet was food. Um, it's the mother of all businesses. Um, it's the biggest employer on the planet. And of course, it's, uh, in an event like this, you know how directly associated the food system is to war, poverty, hunger, opportunity, progress, um, the displacement of water, the support in the communities, or the devastation of rainforests. I mean, we, we, we kind of get that here, right? You see that. And 
So my world got really complicated really quickly. It got really complicated. And I think um, I, I, I was quite lucky. I, even though I knew nothing about telly, I wanted to make my own TV from day one. So I had the ability to not just make chop and chat shows, but also documentaries and campaigns and spend a whole hour on one subject and then let the public decide. And, and I guess the inspiring thing for me was it wasn't just the British public. Mm -hmm. We all had a lot in common, and um, that's probably why I'm in Davos, because a lot of people say, why on earth are you in Davos? And it's because it's a really good use of my time. I get a lot done here. I meet my enemies. I meet the problem. I meet the solution. Uh, you meet fellow activists. And, and I think the world's changing. I think even the bad guys, man, like there's some amazing people in those companies, and and and. and Activism has to change as the world change, you know, and you have to you have to pat people on the back mm -hmm. when big when things have changed in big organisations. So, so have you met any of your enemies this year here in Davos? Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, I won't say who they are because it would be unfair. But and I mean, how was it? Was it um, hostile, embarrassing? Did you no. charm them? Did you seduce them? What happened? I th I, I, th I think it's based on honesty. I mean, and I think. Um, I think you're sizing each other up. I think you're trying to work out if they're a good human or not, or just only obsessed by money. Um, and, um, you know, um, you talk about some stuff happening on the horizon of their business. Um, last year, um, it, it, interestingly, like, I was working with the British government, with Mr. Cameron's government, and um, we were working on a childhood obesity strategy, which was a whole environmental change. You know, a whole number of things, hundreds of activations, where business, the public, and the, and the government, and a whole kind of, um, the way I would explain it, a kind of a blend of education, collaboration, and legislation. You know, if you get that blend right, then you know, having one or two things happening in a country that are brilliant and radical, it's kind of cute, but it's not effective. You need, you need the environment to change. So we were going that way with the British government. But the one thing I was fighting for was a sugary drinks tax, mm -hmm. um, because we had the science, we had the data, it, for, everyone was in support of it. Um, and it, as far as I knew, it wasn't going to happen. So <laughs> last year, I was saying, look, it's probably not going to happen. But like, you've got to watch out for marketing of junk food to kids on TV and on, on, on the internet. So it's kind of like this weird kind of to and fro of what you know. I mean, you can play it any way you want. But of course, what actually happened was we did get a sugary drinks tax. So, so this year, I looked like I was lying, <laughs> but I wasn't. <laughs> um, but interestingly, um, which is a huge success. It, uh, in many respects. I mean, you can look at it from an intelligent way. You can, you know, obviously, the industry, uh, the drinks industry, have their own view. Um, but certainly, as far as the SACAM report, which is our best science report in the world, you know, the single largest source of sugar in Britain and probably many of the developed countries is sugary sweetened drinks. Um, they have a commercially sugar or sugar free option. Um, they're in reformulation anyway. And really, the concept of a tax and the tax we have is a geared tax that really, yeah, we, we, we think we might yield a billion pounds that has been ring fenced to go into school food and, and school, uh, breakfast clubs and sport. Uh, and I think. You know, we poll the, pu the public polling was about 75%. So that ring fencing of the tax to schools was really important, I believe. Um, but um, you know, I, I think uh, for me it was symbolic. It was a symbolic moment in time where you acknowledge a problem, and there is a problem, right? I mean, the, the drinks industry are never going to say say it, but the reality is, is they're too successful. You know, I've worked in too many, uh, too many countries and too many communities where the very poorest hydrate on their product. Yeah, well, in fact, there's a new study that just came out in the US about food stamps, and 10% of um, food stamps are spent on sugary drinks, 10%. So in a sense, the government is subsidizing um, the more obesity. sugary yeah. soft drinks industry and therefore more obesity. Um, I just want to remind you that you won in terms of the uh, tax on sugary drinks in the UK, while Mayor Bloomberg lost in terms of the tax on sugary drinks in New York. Yeah, so but congratulations, pioneer, Jamie man. Oliver. The, the, no, but, no, but Mayor Bloomberg's a dude, and like he's seriously bright and. Like I, I, like, I wish my mayor, you know, well, you are Bloomberg, we are Boris. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like, if you've got a dude that's a genius, 
that gives a lot to society and doesn't even... He ch charges a dollar to New York to be their mayor. Right, you know, he's, uh, I've been to five or six of his lunches, yeah. dinners. They're never for fun. They're always strategic. It's always like-minded people. It's always about prosperity. Clever man. And he's it, continuing you know, it's not, the battle. Well, you know, it's, 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 yeah. it's lives, it's business, it's people. And, and people say he lost, but he was a pioneer. I would have never have done what I did without him. He was the one mm -hmm. that got the sugary drinks tax in Mexico. You know, so as you get France falling into line, Mexico's in line, Britain's falling into line, now there's sort of Portugal, Ireland, you know, it's going to become the norm, right? And the, the reason that is, is territory by territory, if the data and the science is there, then ta <laughs> it's symbolic, but also it's, it, it's a moment. It's a moment, and I think and when I was at the World Health Assembly last year, when I, the news had just come out that we had the sugary drinks tax, Health ministers from around the world stood up and did a round of applause. And you have to ask yourself why. Because they've been in the business of healthcare for so long and they're so frustrated with growing obesity, malnutrition, hunger, diet related disease. And, and just like when change happens, it's like, it's like kind of the floodgates opening again. And, and these people just want to do their job. You know, I, I really want to thank you for positioning it this way because it's so great for activists uh, to recognize that their failures are really stepping stones to the next success. Well, I, I think we, we judge too much the, the, the campaigns as an on-off button or as a, a rock going into a river. It's the ripples that are mostly important mm -hmm. and, and, and the ripples of consistency. Uh, and, and I think... Um, you know, I think the interesting thing about that tax, which is really a metaphor for many views, I mean, I think when you're looking at your own family or your own street or your own town or city or country, I think um, we've made it too easy to make the wrong choice, right? Yes. I lived in the most unhealthy town in America, you know? I was, uh, they pretty much wanted to kick me out for the first three months, and then six months later, I got the key to the city. I mean, that's my life, right? It's always that way. It is always <laughs> from one extreme to the other, and I think... You know, ultimately, it's, about, it's always about trying to create a platform where the community can help the community. I mean, literally, part of the best work I do is say, here's a school, right? You're in charge of 50 schools. Here's a farmer. He's got a cooperative of 50 farmers, right? She cooks stuff 180 days of the year, and he grows it. If you buy off each other, it's a lot cheaper, and it's a lot more healthy, and it's a lot less waste. And then you, they just do it, you know? So like, time and time again, it's, it's always about local people fixing local people. And I think as, as you kind of, uh, like, academically I'm not bright, but I kind of, uh, like, where my head's a bit weird, but I do have a sense of getting, like, just a bit more galactic about the problem. And I think, like, as the developing world is suffering from the crappy foods that we're selling them um, and um, the way that farming's working. I mean, it's interesting, with, but technology, you know, uh, the, the way phones are changing the developing mm -hmm. world. I mean, uh, I, I work with some charities in the UK, Comic Relief, um, which is about hunger and malnutrition in the developing worlds. Uh, and some of the junk food brands that behave in England misbehave in a lot of these countries. It's quite, it's amazing how you can have double standards like this. Um, but interestingly, I struggle desperately about obesity and hunger. I really yes. struggle with that bridge. And um, the way that I can make it OK is food education. So as much as the nuance of change, um, like Huntington, West Virginia, how do you take it off the number one list? And you, you, need multi, you need media to work. You need farmers markets. You need local restaurants. You need to have like, safe water accessible. You need local food from that v valley going into the town, not out to be processed into crap. You know, it's kind of like hundreds of those things. Right, multiple but, interventions. Yeah, but I, but I think at the heart, it's so easy to get lost and sort of drunk by the true solutions. But I just have to pull myself back to, you know, if you can teach a kid the beauty of how to grow stuff, how to pick it, how to cook it, maybe how to eat it and how it affects their body, that, mm -hmm. that has a quadruple effect of beautifulness. You know, not only are you, I mean, I was going into schools in Britain, Australia and America where they didn't know the association between a potato and a french fry. They didn't know that tomato and ketchup, they thought that milk was pink or black because they saw no white milk in the States. Their milk was flavored milk, right? There was more total sugars and a can of Coke in their milk. And you had to take a milk if you wanted a free school lunch, right? So there's all these kind of interconnections that are kind of making it really easy to get really unhealthy. So I think for me, um, when I get drunk, 
I, I truly believe that every country in the world, it should be a child's human right in this moment in time to teach culture, teach maths, teach language and history and geography through food. It's the most beautiful way. You, ne you never learn maths uh, as beautifully at an early age uh, uh, through baking. You know, it's, uh, you never teach science any better than watching a seed turn into a plant that you can pick and eat and shit, I didn't even know that like, like I, I, do you have to eat a, a courgette at that, the, at that age or a pea at that age? Actually it's beautiful through all the life cycles, you know, and we kind of get brainwashed, that's that and that's that. But you know, so I think, I just think um, the problem's so big, but kids are my inspiration and, and, and that's all kids, not just my own, you know. So I just realized, Jamie, that you are not just a chef and an activist, you are a poet. <laughs> and, I think, and I think that's where your power is coming sure. from. It just dawned on me. Um, I, I'm Greek, and you know, in Greece, I grew up with the same kind of reverence for food. Uh, and food was also uh, the center around which the best conversations were had at the kitchen table. Of course, I also had a mother who thought that if we didn't eat every 20 minutes, something terrible would happen to us. <laughs> um, so tell me about this connection between the way food shows up in our lives now and the fact that we're always breathless, that we grab food, um, that we don't really sit down and eat. So many of us just literally eat on the run. And food has lost that uh, sort of sacred element of, of being a way to commune with each other mm. and is so connected with the stress and breathlessness of modern life. Well, um, first of all, the kind of Greek side is kind of interesting because like, I'm studying nutrition at the moment and whether it's science or nutrition, you know, a lot of those words are Greek. You know, and to, to a foreigner, it's a word that you have to learn the meanings of, but in Greek, they often explain not just what it is, but what it does and how it works, you know. And, and, and actually the Greeks were some of the forefathers of really trying to make sense of food as medicine, right? right. And, and, um, and um, I think that if I can be philosophical, I mean, 20 years doing what I'm doing, um, 40 years of living in a pub and serving, you know, the thing, the thing about the pub, which was really, I think what you were saying earlier, is my training ground. Um, it's because it's the most democratic place in the world. Rich, poor, gypsies businessmen, sportsmen, old, young, all ethnic backgrounds, they're all in a pub, they're all welcome. And I think, like, growing up around that, I think, you know, um, you kind of look back, and even 70 years ago, I mean, like, 70 years ago, most food was cooked on solid fuel. We only recently invented the metal box with a metal coil to heat stuff up, it's, you know. And, and now restaurants are going back to open fire and smoke and yes. kind of that connection as you would have with water to flame. And, and that's, I believe, in us, you know, like it's kind mm -hmm. of it's flames and water does yeah. stuff to us. And, and, and that's millions of years of kind of watching it, chilling out by it, cooking over it. And, and um, so what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is humans have always evolved at a rate. We've always been playing catch up. But I do believe that for us right now, with modern technology, we're supercharging it like never, ever, ever, ever before. And I think that our generation is trying to balance the best of technology in the future and brilliance of that with the best bits of millions of years of evolution, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and that's a bit out of whack at the moment. And um, so uh, what does that mean? It's like as we, humans' brains are programmed to sort of, you know, when we, we always want to cut corners. We want to do things faster. And as we build more time, we fill it. And um, so as big, small amounts of companies fix problems for us, I'll fix it for you as they fix your time problems. Um, it's highly likely, because it's what's happened, is that it's going to be high, high in salt, fat, and sugar, and, and hugely processed. And, yeah. and probably the methods of production of that are not necessarily good for our planet or the soil. Or You, you know the story. You all know the story. So I think... I think, um, I think that when you know the basics of growing and cooking, I think you're a better human. Fact. I think we could do with that right now on the planet, right? I, I want to see Donald Trump growing some stuff and cooking some stuff. <laughs> right? That would be fantastic. I want to see it. Maybe he can use Because if not, I'm building my bunker. You know, it's, 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 like, I just think that, that, that like, it's... We always look at oil, we always look at banking, we always look at the, you know, selling of arms as these big in industries. The biggest industry on the planet is food. 
And, well, let's and see what he does with Michelle Obama's garden in the White House. What do you think? What's your prediction? It ain't going nowhere. You think he's going yeah, to Yeah, because he's like a chameleon, it. isn't he? He's just kind of regurgitating the stuff that works. He's just like, he's just kind of like, he's just spinning, like, you know, his family are too, too queued up on the PR to, to know what works. You know, you, that there's a symbolic visual. If you cut down that garden, you're cutting down hope. He ain't going to do that whether he believes in it or not. He ain't stupid. What? <laughs> he's a clever man. But do you know what I mean? Like, he's got where he's got for a reason. And, 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 and so the, the, the question is, is, what does happen with the food system? You know, the food system is very stressed in America. And, and, um, and you know, and, and the way Europe, I mean, Europe, Europe has got its problems, but it's, as far as food safety is concerned and farming and standards, it's one of the best in the planet. Um, and we're not going to be it any, anymore. So one of the scariest things as a Brit is if we do a big deal with, with America, which is essentially what was going to be the European trade agreement with America, the TTIP, the, the biggest scary thing for us is a fair playing field for their farmers and ours? No, because we don't have hormones. We don't have GMOs. Yeah. We don't have a whole hundreds of pesticides that are banned because they're, they're thought to be carcinogenic or this, that, and the other. Like, <laughs> no disrespect, but we don't want a lot of their gear unless it's to our standards. And, and, and the beauty of Europe, of course, is it's... The tension that maybe we didn't celebrate enough, the tension of those cult their cultures, they were food lovers, right? That tension was all protecting like stuff that mattered. So the, my fear is that we do a big old deal to make our life easier now, and we're just going to be flooded with well, stuff so that we don't want our kids to eat. Uh, Trump is against the TTPI, so uh, there's well, who knows what happens tomorrow, there. right? And, uh, and, and I would like us all to visualize Jamie and Donald in the garden together, <laughs> <laughs> growing some eggplants and tomatoes and cooking a healthy lunch instead of the way he's always photographed eating these greasy cheeseburgers or Kentucky Fried Chicken or all these things that we know lead uh, Listen, to no, serious the, problems. The, the, the thing is, right, he likes a dollar. Right? And commerce is really important. We're in Davos, right? Mm -hmm. This balance between commerce and progress is really important. But I, I think, you know, like um, hope, love, having, you know, we got to hand the planet over to the kids in a better place than we left it. And that ain't happening right now. You know, currently in most developed countries, it's the first generation where they're expected to live a shorter life than yes. their parents, right? That's wrong. That's wrong. So I think, I think you know, um, there's lots of challenges at the moment, uh, and food's at the heart of it. And um, I do think the big companies can be part of the solution. I mean, I, you know, just randomly picking a brand like Coke, you know, in 100 years' time, could they be a brand that props up amazing education in goodness? Uh, and could it be a health brand? I think yes, honestly. And I, and I say that as someone that's a pain in their backside. I really, I, I think the transition of uh, the next 30 years and what they... But isn't 100 years too long? I mean, if we have to wait for 100 well, years... Well, I guess I picked a number to kind of... Yeah. Um, Can we say paint. 10? <laughs> <laughs> well, interestingly, if you wanted to make salad cool, um, it's not getting me and David Beckham to push it, although that would be fun. Um, it, it's really getting McDonald's and Coke to make it cool, because, like, mm -hmm. they... they they're kind of down with the kids, right? So it's kind of, you know, um, and, uh, and I think that I spent two years going around parts of the world where people live the longest, right? And, and it was an opportunity for me to really kind of look into these, these geographical areas and at the people and at the businesses and where they are. And, and most of them, with the exception of Switzerland, were poor, right? Which, for me, is an incredible relief because, for me, in a, you know, living in London, maybe it's the same in your countries, far too often... Even having a love of food, even a love of food is considered middle class. You know, let alone yes. investing in a set of pans or a knife. You know, yeah, you rich lot, you don't understand. But what for me was really powerful, as I travel around the world, you know, I might see the problem. But when you go to a really poor community and you see beautiful people feed incredible food that's healthy by default to their kids and sit at that table like a proud man, a proud mum, feeding kids full of life, Right? When I see that, for me, that's like, that is everything. That is confirmation that they're, you know, I, I, I mean, with the exception of famine and all the kind of stuff that is awful, generally speaking, there's no excuse why all humans can't enjoy food. And, 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 and I've always learned the most about food in the poorest communities. <laughs> food cultures, you know, when humans are incredible, when they're put under pressure and, um, you know, when they know how to cook, they cook incredible food. You know, the best food on the planet has always come 
from humans that could cook that were put under pressure. The problem that happens, which is triply awful, is when you can't cook and you're put under pressure, you're screwed. And, and you'll therefore see patterns. And that's, you know, the, the reality in the planet right now is the double burden of the developed and the developing world. Mm -hmm. I mean, the rise of obesity and type 2 diabetes in countries famous for famine now is kind of shocking. So, yeah, I guess if there's one thing, it was, for me, I always kind of try and look for structures that can breed hope and good things. And I just mm -hmm. think it's school and under 10 year old, under 12, and under 11 year old kids, it's, it's like the magic time. Um, and so what can government do here to accelerate the shift and to produce the kind of little nudges that change behavior? What was the beginning of the conversation? Government. When we talked about um, schools, we talked about activists, chefs. Is there a role well, for yeah, government? For anyone, that, for anyone that here that understands government, I mean, I've been kind of like, I went from nothing to working with government 11 years ago. So 11 years ago, I did a documentary about school food in Britain. We were feeding our kids crappy food 190 days of the year for breakfast and lunch from the age of 4 to 16, which is nearly half of their food that they eat for their childhood. We were helping making them ill. And we had no standards. In Britain, 11, 12 years ago, we had standards that were robust for dog food and nothing for kids' food. That's how screwed up we were. And we're kind of considered like, you know, a G whatever country, right? Daft as arseholes two, two, 12 years ago. Honestly, I mean, honestly, it's unacceptable. So we created those standards. We kind of, you know, uh, but, but so what am I saying about government? I think, um, um, I think it's really tough. I mean, most ministers... Uh, we've been through like 10 education secretaries in 12 years. Um, uh, they move on. They're like ships that pass in the night. Um, uh, most CEOs, CMOs, and, and most uh, governments are kind of in four-year cycles, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's very short-termism. Um, uh, so I think Canada's really exciting at the moment. I'm really excited about Canada as far as getting some level-headed, clever people in one place at a nice moment with not too much dodgy stuff going on. I mean, <laughs> their obesity strategy looks exciting. Um, at the moment, um, and that's going to be released in the next, I don't know, six months or something, who knows, soonish. So I'm, I'm personally looking at them to be an example for many countries around the world. Um, it was going to be Britain, but our obesity strat strategy uh, got, I believe, um, completely pulled apart by the new government post-Brexit. Um, so we, I got the leaked document from Mr Cameron's obesity strategy that I was part of, so I know what was going to be in. I knew what I was going to fight for in the last 36 hours to sort of like get what I wanted from what he wanted. So I think it would have been a good strategy. And I know what she delivered, which was a complete, I mean, the scary thing, of course, is as well, they think it's great. So there's nothing more scary than people that, I think they genuinely think they've done a great job, which for me, right, is worrying because I know it's not up to scratch. But they, I mean, they released their strategy after two years at midnight on the same time as all the A-level a results came out in August when they're all on holiday, no minister owned it. They, uh, there's the only legislation part of it I know I put there, which is, was the campaign for the sugary drinks tax mm -hmm. that Mr. Osborne put there. <laughs> so, um, so it's, you know, a missed opportunity. But, I mean, I think the reality, I mean, for me, the way I see it in my funny little eyes is we will, many countries, put a strategy that's robust together the question is, is that in 20 years' time or 30 years' time, you know, humans are kind of, you know, we often don't like the idea of change until we're not changing is more painful, right? So, um, so we're kind of looking for pioneers again, really. So, And including, you know, given that the theme in this year's Davos is responsible and responsive leadership among business people, political leaders, yeah. media leaders, um, can you name some names of responsible and responsive leaders that you've worked with in business, in media, in government, anywhere? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I think interestingly, I, I think we're in a time now where I, I think um, I've started to learn and I'm trying to be sympathetic and, and understand it without compromising my own values. But, you know, even in the companies that are part of the problem, there's management and CEOs that are good and bright and have families and care. And so I think it's, I'm, I'm trying to come up with some kind of global awards 
maybe for next year, um, uh, maybe we can do it together, or who knows. But I think it's important to pat those people on the back yes. when they do good. Um, I think the narrative that they have to, t you know, because they're, they're in a way, and I'm, I shouldn't stick up for them, but I'm going to, um, they have to fight people like me who are a pain in the ass. They have to fight the public. They have to fight the press. <coughs> they have to fight their own internal battles, for better or for worse, and they have to fight their investors. Right. And I think, you know, if you look at people like Paul Pullman, who I think is an inspirational leader, um, he, I mean, you could, you could look at him in many different ways, but he has amplified confidence in other C CEOs to <coughs> clean up your portfolio, fix big problems, be honest about what you haven't fixed, right, and, and curate bad financial news to your investors without losing your job. And when good people lose their job because they're a little bit too yeah. feisty, that's a problem. So <clears throat> I do, <coughs> sorry, I've got a couple yeah, of times. Yeah, some water. <coughs> um, I think um, sometimes really good people get fired too quick because it's a very fine play moving companies on. And, and, and I think um, the way that companies are invested, who invest in them, how they want their returns, Oh, you know, so some of those few family-run businesses in the food business, I think, are fascinating right now because their ability to have a 25-year view. Well, I love what you said because... Um, and also, McDonald's, UK. Co controversial, maybe. But I have to say that McDonald's, UK, who have been public enemy number one maybe 15 years ago, have done 10 years of solid marketing to tell the truth about 100% organic milk, free-range eggs... <clears throat> good supply chain on meat, um, the way they work and train their staff. I mean, like, you know, I, I used to be someone that slagged them off. They have not lied, and they've had a, a, mm -hmm. a carrot of aspiration for 13 years since Steve Eastbrook, who's now gone to the States. And for me, I think what's, <clears throat> what's important now is making small businesses bigger and more prolific and more successful is important. Supporting medium-sized businesses to be more sustainable um, and helping big businesses or... or, or being interested in big businesses being better. You've got to have all three gears working. I and think. you are seeing that beginning to happen. I mean, look at PepsiCo. They're um, trying to reduce the revenue that comes from Pepsi and increase the revenue that comes from Quaker Roads and other yeah. uh, nutritional products. We are doing a partnership with them at Thrive Global. So I'm completely with you in yeah. supporting all the good things that big businesses are doing, and let's do the global yeah, awards. I think, I think it's important. Pepsi, they, they, I think what's important is uh, at an event like this, everyone's always going to tell you the good stuff they're doing, and that's important. Because you, But I think it's there's a kind of academic view, there's an accountancy view, there's a kind of stock market view, and I think the part that I'm kind of, I guess, invested in is the human view, which is the most erratic. And I think, I think you know, empowering communities around the world to realize that when they spend a dollar, it's a vote, and empowering people around the world to want more. Why is it that the British McDonald's is radically different to the Americans? It's only one thing, only one thing, and that is because we have a history of documentaries, you know, yeah. really cynical journalists, you know, the tension that the makes people, yeah, you've got to keep people honest. Mm -hmm. And, and um, out of sight, out of mind, don't care. When it's in the conversation, we evolve, and I think that's the most important thing. So two very quick last questions because we ran out of time. One is, where should we go to eat in Davos? Have you discovered <laughs> a great restaurant? Come and find me. And, and you're um, going to cook and, for uh, us? <laughs> we, we, we did a really amazing event last, uh, a waste event last night when we had chefs from around the world cooking with waste things. I, my course was cooked outside. It was so cold. <laughs> um, but um, I don't actually know. You I'm haven't so had sorry. time to explore I, 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 the I, uh, restaurant scene. OK, finally, finally. So what does mealtime look like at the Oliver household with five children? I would say that seven out of ten meals are absolute chaos. <laughs> and when it's beautiful, when it's, one, when it's a three out of ten, when there's like a nice moment and like kids are doing all the right things, I look at my wife and she looks at me and, you know, we're happy, but like we know there's a depth of fear there because we know, <laughs> we know we're 30 seconds away from carnage. Um, but um, no, pretty mad. I mean, from fifth hormones of teenagers to, um, you know, the needs of a baby and then toddlers that have got more energy than you could believe. But um, yeah, I think, I think having really a lot of my activism started when Poppy was born. And I think... Um, 
And then just before that, when I started 15, which is a, a restaurant that's a charity that trains kids from sort of colourful backgrounds and, and underprivileged backgrounds, you know, it was a moment where I start, instead of looking at kids as just like those annoying kids in the street, I, the minute when you start seeing them as someone else's kids, mm -hmm. it's slightly different, do you know what I mean? So I think like, I, I came from a school that I, I did really badly at school. Uh, I didn't fall in love with education. I hated it. Um, I was a dyslexic kid, so I, I read my first book a year and a half ago. Um, what and, was it? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, it was um, Hunger Games 2. Oh. And, um, I uh, like that you I skipped loved, Hunger Games 1. <laughs> well, I saw, no, I, I, I saw, the reason I did it was because I saw the first one and I loved it so much that um, I wanted to see what happened next and I couldn't wait for the film. Um, but um, I'd, never, I'd never really been able to invest in, I just couldn't do it. So I've written 20 books but I, and I've always done it on dictaphone or, or with people. But um, I think in some ways it's, and I think like, you know, work, working with dyslexia around the world, it's kind of like, because um, you don't fit into a social norm, it, it doesn't mean you're useless, right? You can stick, you just have to work around it. And, and, um, uh, and I don't, and I always say congratulations, you know, it's, you know, you're going to see the world in a different place, uh, in a different way. And, and yeah, I, 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 I'm very lucky to have my job. It's a, it's a very, my job is quite wide now and, and, um, and I'm, I feel, every day I feel desperately under-resourced and uh, maybe not fit to be able to make use of the information I'm given. Um, so uh, three years ago I went back to school, so I'm doing a Master's in Nutrition at the moment, and uh, it's just trying to understand stuff. And I have to say, it's one of the best things I've ever done. You know, ha having grown up in the food industry, it's almost like, learning Latin when you've, <laughs> you've spoken all the kind of Latin-based languages. You just, ah. Oh. That's and, where it um, comes from. So, yeah, I think it's, I, I think um, behind the scenes of sort of Jamie Oliver's world now is, uh, uh, probably doesn't, <laughs> I, w I would call ourselves a type 2 diabetes obesity fighting machine. I, like, we are restructured in the last three years. So we had different things, we're all cute, and bakeries and restaurants and production companies and uh, design companies and all sorts of random stuff. We've like, focused it all down, and, and, and really at the heart of it is like, how do we create content that helps empower? And win the fight. Yeah. Well, Jamie, you said you're lucky to have your job, and I want to end by saying we are very lucky to have Jamie Oliver. Thank you so much. <laughs>